Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner, I should have addressed you first. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And first of all, I just want to thank you very sincerely for your invitation to be here this afternoon. And uh, it was great to hear the, the Commissioner's response. And indeed, uh, as, as our Chairperson has said, I suppose you're really interested to see you know, what can MEPs do about this. Well, I suppose I might start by saying one of the good things about being an MEP is that you do get an opportunity to influence outcomes and, and to affect change, and also to respond to some of the issues raised by your constituents. And as far as this Sharps Directive is concerned, it allowed MEPs an opportunity to influence and indeed in my case to respond to a number of matters that were raised by my constituents on the issue of needle stick injuries. But one of the negatives, or shall we say maybe less positive outcomes, is that very often for an MEP there's little opportunity to follow up. The Commission are the guardians of the treaty and it is largely their responsibility to ensure that EU legislation and regulations are properly transposed into national law and then properly implemented at national level. Now most of you will probably think to yourselves, but surely MEPs will follow up, see how legislation is working or perhaps not working and learn from their mistakes so that hopefully they won't repeat them. But things are not always that straightforward. I know you have already heard the background to the current legislation, which started back in 89 with the initial directive. That directive, of course, has been amended twice since then, in 95 and 2001. And in both 2005 and 2006, the Parliament adopted resolutions calling for legislation to address the risk of working with needles and medical sharps and on protecting healthcare uh, workers from bloodborne uh, infections due to needle stick injuries. And in 2010, of course, the current legislation was passed and must be implemented by May 11, 2013. Now, if you think about it, that's 24 years from start to finish, or six consecutive mandates for an MEP. Now, that merely deals with the time frame, which of, of course is crucial, but it makes no reference to the mountains of other legislation, let alone all of the treaties that we have passed in the meantime. So the point I make is that from a practical day-to-day -day point of view, from the life of an MEP, and for, just, for some MEPs that's just one mandate, five years, there's really very little opportunity to follow up because of the, the volume and the ongoing nature of the work and also because the avenues for follow-up are not nearly as clear-cut or obvious as those that lead to the adoption of the legislation in the first place. Now, all of you are well aware yourselves of the challenges of implementing this directive in your own member state. And I'm sure having heard your colleagues this morning from Spain, the UK, Romania and Bulgaria, you now have a broader perspective on those challenges and indeed the opportunities. So hearing what works and what doesn't work uh, gives all of us an opportunity to learn from best practice. And you as healthcare practitioners, you are driving that agenda forward, but you rightly expect that politicians, both at national and at EU level, spearhead the effort in order to ensure effective implementation of this directive. So, how can you engage your politicians? Well, first of all, at national level. It is the responsibility of national politicians to ensure the transposition of this legislation and indeed its effective implementation. That includes the provision of resources, adequate training, awareness raising for all stakeholders, etc. And believe it or not, awareness raising among politicians is also very important. Again, because of the nature of their work and the huge number of issues that they deal with, uh, a piece of legislation on needle stick injuries may not necessarily be top of their priority list. Not because they don't care about it or they don't think it's important, but because in many cases they won't even be aware of it. And even if they are, it will certainly fight for a position on their list of priorities. So, your representative organisations will have to be proactive in keeping an eye on the progress of legislation through your national parliament and then lobbying to see that adequate resources are put in place to ensure its effective implementation. Now, from an Irish perspective, that would include close collaboration with the relevant minister or junior ministers, perhaps appearing before a parliamentary committee to make your case 
and raise awareness among the relevant politicians. Obviously, meeting with spokespersons from the opposition on health and indeed individual TDs will be important. This can be uh, coordinated at national level, but I would always say that local people meeting the local TD has its own effect. And for those of you who are not Irish, of course, TD is chock the dollar, which means an Irish parliamentarian, so for, forgive me using that. And I suppose my final comment uh, there would be sometimes identifying the effect of public servants who will be involved in the delivery of the legislation and influencing them uh, on timely and effective delivery can be very important. You all know what they say about the importance of the permanent government. So, in a way, does that let European politicians off the hook? Can we, like Pontius Pilate, wash our hands and say, our work is done, it's now somebody else's responsibility? Well, I suppose, strictly speaking, we can, but my advice to you is that you shouldn't let us. First of all, I think you need to identify those who have a particular interest, either because they've already worked on the issue or because in some way they can influence other areas of European legislation, and I'll return to that in, in just a moment. But at a national and indeed European level, you should keep us informed of progress in your own member state. First of all, MEPs too have contacts at national level and they can lobby on your behalf and not just uh, with politicians but also with health authorities and with different agencies within their own member state. Secondly, uh, the Commission has spoken about a number of projects that are underway. There can also sometimes be the possibility of looking at transnational pilot projects in areas of awareness raising, uh, exchanging best practice and education and training also. And coming back to the first point I made earlier about influencing other areas of European legislation, over the next year or two, MEPs will be centrally involved in drawing up guidelines on the structural funds and in work on, on the social fund also. And that may well provide opportunities to help ensure that funding can be made available for health-related projects. Now, this is already the situation, of course, you can access funding from uh, these funds, but perhaps it could be improved or enhanced, especially if MEPs on the relevant committees are well briefed on the issue when they're drawing up these guidelines. And finally, of course, in a few years' time, if there are problems, severe problems, with the implementation in different member states, then there are structures within the European system that can help. And these would include the Petitions Committee, complaints to the Commission, etc. But hopefully, we won't need to explore any of those avenues. So those are some of the challenges and opportunities from a political perspective. And while that's, of course, only a part of the overall challenge that you as healthcare workers uh, uh, have, nonetheless it is an important part and your politicians both at national and European level I think can help to drive the agenda forward. And finally just two quick comments before I finish. The first is directly related to the directive and again the Commissioner has mentioned this because I think great credit is due to EPSU, the European Public Sector Unions, and HOSPEAM, the, U the European Hospital and Healthcare Employers Association, for taking the initiative and concluding a framework agreement. I think it's a very good example of cooperation between the social partners and the EU institutions leading to good legislation. And my second point, it's not directly related, but it does concern the INMO, the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation, and also the ICN, the International Council of Nurses. And I simply want to applaud them for their recent expression of alarm and concern for the 24 nurses and 23 physicians who were arrested in Bahrain. You were prepared to speak out in defence of your colleagues who were accused of anti-state activity when they were simply providing care to wounded civilians. Now politicians should follow your lead and call for an independent external investigation into the situation. Indeed, to quote Angela Dixon, president of INMO, as she said, human rights entitlements, medical neutrality and the ethical responsibility of healthcare professionals must take precedence over political issues in, term, in times of conflict. I absolutely agree with Sheila 
And to finish off in the context of today's discussion, I believe that the welfare of healthcare workers and their protection from bloodborne infections caused by needle stick injuries must now take centre stage and it must be a priority for politicians to ensure that this piece of good legislation is finally translated into good practice on the ground. Thank you.